Okay, it is noon in the Eastern time zone. It's ready uh, time to begin. I'm just so glad to have you here today. And uh, my name is Bill Gibbs. I'll be the moderator for the session today. Our presentation today is counterterrorism, understanding a new category of active threats with uh, Dr. Joshua Sinai. I am personally looking forward to this. For those of you that uh, were in um, uh, listening in in the sound check, I was telling Dr. Sinai that um, I am based in Texas and uh, we have been particularly beset by um, active threats and uh, terroristic type of activities. And in fact, I think even in his presentation, he'll mention at least one of those. So uh, I uh, watch this both at a professional and a personal interest. Let me talk about the agenda that we'll be following today. And by the way, this is being recorded and we will be sending a copy of the recording and slides to everybody who has registered for the session today. Now, uh, if you'll wear, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm trying to multitask here and I'm thinking that we have some late attendees who do not have the uh, uh, link and so I'm trying to get that taken care of if you'll give, bear with me for a second. Uh, there's always those who uh, uh, join us right at the very last that I'm not able to uh, bring into the session. Okay, let's talk about the agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk just very briefly about Capital Technology University. I recognize that many of you are very familiar with it, but there's always a few that are not. We'll go over the session pointers, the housekeeping, and then I'll introduce the presenter. Uh, we'll hear the presentation from Dr. Sinai. That is the bulk, of course, of the webinar. Uh, we'll open the floor to questions via the text chat. And by the way, you can ans uh, you can type in questions via the text chat at any time. We will not be activating video or audio for participants, but we will have the text chat available. So make sure you have that up and running. Uh, I'll talk briefly about the upcoming webinars in November and then after the first of the year and then how to get a copy of the recording slides and a certificate of participation. Just a, a wee bit about Capital Technology University. Again, recognizing that we have students, faculty, and alumni joining us today, in it, but there may be a few that are not that familiar with us. We're located in Laurel, Maryland. We've been there a long, long time. We've been around in the capital, uh, Washington, D.C. area since 1927. So this decade, we'll celebrate our 100th anniversary. We're a nonprofit, private accredited university. Uh, all, most all of our undergraduate, with a few exceptions, and I'll mention that, uh, are located on our campus in Maryland and uh, all of our graduate programs and some of our uh, undergraduate degrees are located online or conducted online. We are accredited with the regional accreditation from the Middle States Commission and the state of Maryland has authorized us to confer degrees all the way from associate right up to the doctorate. I do wanna mention here as a commercial, if you will, that Capital has counterterrorism degrees at the bachelor's master's and doctoral level. And uh, Dr. Sinai directs those programs. He will not be directly talking about those today, but if you do have a question about them, I'm cer certainly sure that he will answer those questions. And uh, even if you don't have a question, I think it's good to know that we offer those uh, degrees at all three of those levels. Now with that, I don't wanna delay this. I wanna get right into the presentation. So let me go ahead and get the session pointers out of the way and then get our speaker introduced. We'll answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, but you can post the question at any time in the text chat. I'll be monitoring that and we'll answer just as many as we possibly can. Microphones and webcams are not activated for participants. A link to the recording and to the slides will be sent to you and will be later available on our webinar page. Uh, we'll also make available to you a participation certificate if you wish to have one. And when I send out the email at the end of the presentation, uh, that will give instructions on how to get the certificate into your hands. With that, let's, let's go right into the presentation. Again, uh, the presentation is entitled Counterterrorism, Understanding the New Category of Active Threats. And let me please introduce uh, uh, Dr. Joshua Sinai to you. Uh, Dr. Sinai is Chair and Professor of Intelligence and Security Studies at Capital Technology University. 
Uh, he's based in the Washington, D.C. area, and he has more than 35 years experience in inter international security, national security, homeland security studies, assessments, and curriculum development for the U.S. government, academia, and the corporate sector. For the U.S. government, he began his career as a senior intelligence analyst at the Federal Research Division of the Library of Congress. On behalf of various corporate firms, he has worked as a contractor supporting the Department of Defense, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff the Department of, and the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, as part of the Foreign Terrorist Tracking Task Force. He's the author or co-author of 50 plus scholarly articles on terrorism and counterterrorism, and literally helped write the book on preventing active shooters. He'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of his presentation. He earned his MA and PhD in political science from Columbia University. With that, Dr. Sinai, welcome. Give me a moment to give you screen control mm -hmm. and to turn off my video and audio. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this presentation. I, I really appreciate it. Um, on, on, on Twitter, there's a wonderful site called Rate My Room, in which uh, they, they rate the, the backdrops to those who are interviewed on Zoom. So I hope that my backdrop um, gets a high rating from you, or at least a favorable one. In this presentation, I will discuss a new way of understanding a certain type of terrorism related threat category that is usually overlooked, active threats. One of the problems with what we call conventional terrorism studies is that it only looks at one type of terrorist threat. That is, terrorists are those who attack civilians and the military but without incorporating related threat categories that are also engaged in by terrorists. By this, I mean that some of those who engage in terrorism, especially lone actors, and I prefer to use lone actors as opposed to lone wolves, because I think that wolves are much smarter than individuals who um, engage in terrorism on, on their own. So also use active shooter tactics and or active shooters, carry out their attacks at their places of employment so they engage in workplace violence and are insiders to their organizations who are known to some of their intended victims. For effective counterterrorism, therefore, it is crucial to expand our analytical apertures by applying a multidisciplinary approach that will enable us to identify those who are embarked on such a trajectory into violence from multidisciplinary perspectives for improved preemption capabilities. As you see, any ordinary day can suddenly turn extraordinary. These types of violent attacks are not abstractions, but occur in real life. In my case, on 9-11, I worked for a firm in Shirlington, south of the Pentagon. When I happened to be driving to work late that morning, I had an errand to do at home. And I was driving along Key Bridge, actually listening to a CD of the Rolling Stones in concert, so I had no idea what had happened that morning. When I suddenly saw a ball of fire shoot up into the air, followed by a cloud of smoke, it was the plane that crashed into the Pentagon a few minutes earlier. On June 14, 2017, around 8 a.m., I was driving along Jefferson Davis Highway in Crystal City on, on the way to my office in Old Town, Virginia, when I saw police cars with their lights flashing lined up along a baseball field. There had just been a shooting rampage by James Hodgkinson at a practice session by congressional personnel with a US congressman wounded. Although I was not directly involved, a friend of mine knew a veteran reporter whose son luckily was away from the Capitol Gazette newspaper 
which experienced an active shooter attack on June 28, 2018. So these incidents also affect those who are indirectly involved. For instance, those who know someone who might be affected directly. For the victims, these incidents often occur as a complete surprise. However, in each of the past incidents, early warning observables were present that could have prevented them. So the, the objective is to empower everyone with the capability to be aware of such early warning observables in your surroundings. And if noticed, to report them to the appropriate authorities, whether in your organization or law enforcement for um, early preemption. It is therefore important to be aware that such incidents can occur anywhere and anytime where we work, where we learn, where we shop, where we serve, where we worship, and where we seek leisure. These are some of the significant active threat type incidents that have occurred over the past 12 years. And, and many more occurred during this period. And we, um, and, and we need to be precise in the um, identifying the threat types that characterize such active threat actors. For example, in the uh, September 2013 Navy Yard attack, the, the shooter, uh, Aaron Alexis was a, a contractor. He was known to his um, fellow employees. And um, he, so he was an insider. He engaged in um, workplace violence. But it occurred, it occurred to me that since he was attacking a Navy facility, wasn't it always also a terrorism attack? So I asked a friend of mine who happened to be the leader of the SWAT team who had actually shot, shot him if, if there was a terrorism component to it. And he said, no, it was purely workplace related. He um, was told that he was about to be fired. So um, unlike many academics who will never let facts get in the way of a good hypothesis, I gave in and um, agreed that only three of the threat types um, were uh, had um, characterized the, the shooter. So, so, so we need to be precise in, in the way we characterize these uh, threat actors. Now, although the January 6th takeover of the US Capitol building was not an active threat incident as such, and it is under investigation by a congressional committee, we need to continuously be aware of new trends in active threat type incidents when several categories of threat types converge in a single incident so that we are not surprised when they do occur. So these are the, the four types of threats that converge to form um, an active threat type um, to actor. They, they um, have to engage in, and they have to be characterized by at least three out of these four types. So the four are terrorism, active shooter, workplace violence, and insiders. And as you see, um, these um, are characterized by every possible type of actor. So, 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 so there's no one, one specific stereotype. It can be Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and, and, and so on. So, so we need to, um, so, the, the, so hybrid threats incorporate multidimensional threat actors. 
And so active threat actors engage in at least three out of the four types of uh, threat actors. Now, just to give you an example, James Hopkinson on the lower um, right from Bellsville, Illinois, who carried out the June 14, 2017 shooting attack in um, Arlington or Alexandria, had spent several days at the baseball practice area under suspicious circumstances. So he was known to some employees. And that's why, as someone acting out of the ordinary, so that's why I characterize him as an insider. Stephen Paddock on the upper left corner, who carried out the Las Vegas shooting on October 1, 2017. Um, has, his motivation has still not been officially revealed, but he, he was an active shooter. He engaged in workplace violence and he was an insider. Um, it, his motivation may not have involved terrorism, so as I will explain later, three out of four threat types are required to consider an attacker as an active threat category actor. So the first type are terrorists. Note that my definition is more comprehensive than the conventional definition of terrorism as involving only the targeting of non-combatant civilians. In real life, terrorists also intentionally attack the armed military and armed law enforcement personnel. So these need to be incorporated into a comprehensive definition of terrorism. One of the advantages of being an academic is that we can formulate definitions without the restrictions that may be placed on government officials. For instance, the targeting of non-combatant civilians will make it possible to indict terrorists in civil courts as opposed to military courts. Also note that the active threat actors are lone actors, as opposed to being members of organized groups. These make them similar in many ways to active shooters who are lone actors, although it is possible for a second attacker to be part of such operations. The second type of actors in the active threat category are active shooters. These are um, individuals who are armed and in the process of engaging in a shooting spree with the intent of continuously harming others, whether in open area or in a confined environment. And also in, in my definition of active shooters, they um, engaged, engage in random and in, intentionally um, targeting their um, adversaries. They, they act as lone actors as opposed to belonging to a group. Generally, they are psychologically disordered. They're driven by very varied, varied mo motivations. And as I mentioned earlier, the tar their targeting of attack victims may be intentional or random or a combination. Also note that in many official definitions, they only consider um, the random targeting, not the intentional targeting of the victims. But, but when, you, when you examine the cases, you'll find out that in many of the cases, they do in, intentionally target um, many of their victims. And their weapons generally include firearms, although other types of weapons may also be used such as edged weapons, knives, whether separately or in combination. The third type of active threat actors are those who engage in workplace violence, which involves actual violence or the threat of violence against employees. And there are three levels of threat, um, verbal threat, raising a threatening fist and physical attack. Here we are concerned with the, um, the highest level of threat, uh, physical attack and it can occur at or outside of the workplace. And there are four types of workplace violence, criminal, customer, patient, worker and worker, or ex-worker and worker, and personal relationship. In our categorization of active threat actors, we focus on types two and three. 
In type two, the attacker will likely be known to the targeted company or organization as the regular client. An example is Omar Martin, who carried out the shooting rampage at the Pulse nightclub on, in June 2016. It was reported that he was a regular customer at the club, so he was known to some of the employees. Stephen Paddock, who carried out the October 1, 2017 shooting rampage in Las Vegas, was a regular customer at the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino. So he, he was known to the employees at, at that hotel and also at the um, casinos in, in Las Vegas. The fourth type of threat actor is the um, inside uh, of the insiders. And as I discussed earlier, active threat actors are generally known to their intended victims to some extent, whether as fellow employees or as customers. And one of the advantages of being an, an insider attacker is that it is easier for them to access their workplaces, even at hardened facilities such as the Navy Yard or the Pentagon or uh, other hardened facilities and access to their organization's personnel can increase the, the lethality of the attacks. So when Major Nidal Hassan carried out his shooting rampage at Fort Hood, Texas, he had access to the base. So he was able to um, kill many of his fellow soldiers uh, relatively easily. So, it, so to, to be considered as an active threat actor, they need to be characterized by at least three out of four of, of, of these characteristics. Uh, so they're either psychologically disordered active shooters or ideologically extremist terrorists with a direct relation to their intended target as insiders, which generally occurs at their workplace or a venue where they are known as customers. Note that lone actor terrorists, for various reasons, are considered to be prone to a higher degree of psychological disorder, which makes them um, very similar to those who engage in psychologically disordered um, active shooting attacks. And this needs to be examined empirically on a case-by-case -case basis. In the forthcoming chapter on preempting lone actor terrorists in the United States, based on some 45 cases, I analyze the psychological dispositions of lone actor terrorists in greater detail. The chapter will be published in an edited volume on preventing lone actor terrorists to be published by Oxford University Press in, in a few months. As you see, Active threat actors utilize a variety of weapon types, firearms, um, vehicles, edged weapons, explosive devices. Now what, what's important for us to analyze is what are some of the future trends? Will they utilize in their attacks armed drones, cyber weapons, as well as these and, 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 and more conventional weapons in, in, in the same attack. So we will always have to be aware of potential new trends in, in terms of, of the weapons that they are likely to use so that we are not surprised when, when they occur. This Pathway to Violence model is based on the widely used 2003 Calhoun and Weston six phases based pathway to violence model. In my model, I um, map the trajectory into violence along eight phases. So I've added two phases to the Calhoun and Weston model. 
phase one, which I basically invented, uh, involves a, a cognitive opening. Um, so the, the individuals that we're looking at uh, will have um, psychological characteristics that will range from being psychologically normal to having all, all sorts of psychiatric disorders. This doesn't mean that those who have psych a psychological disorder will necessarily turn to violence. There has to be a triggering event that will compel them to um, start thinking about turning to violence. So I've also changed the Calhoun and Western first phase grievance in, into the triggering events phases, which I think better characterizes what is going on. They will experience all sorts of traumatic crises, personal, professional, ideological, which will lead to strongly held grievances. Again, this doesn't mean that those who experience such traumatic crises will necessarily turn to violence. And then in phase three, they will begin to what is termed um, violently ideate about taking some sort of revenge to redress their, their grievance. They will start thinking about redressing grievances through violent revenge. Again, this doesn't mean that those who think about taking revenge to redress um, self-perceived wrongdoing will necessarily turn to violence. In fact, we, we, we all think about taking revenge against someone. But for example, in, in my case, and by the way, I'm, I'm an analyst, so I can talk about it freely. I have no weapons. I have no desire to acquire a weapon. And so on. So for most people, the this portion of the trajectory into violence will end in phase three. But then for a minority of individuals, who do cross the threshold, they, they will do so because of the absence of restraining factors, such as uh, constructive support mechanisms and networks by families, friends, and others. And when they do cross the threshold, and this again applies to a tiny, tiny portion of individuals who feel aggrieved, their response will either be reactive or predatory. In, in the reactive phase, they will start taking uh, revenge almost immediately. It could be the same day or the following day or within, within two or three days. When, when they will carry out an attack, but in a predatory response, they will take their time, which could be a week, a month, uh, several months, and in some cases, even a year before they carry out their attack. And then they will enter phase five, the planning phase, where they will actually begin planning an attack the type of attack, they will identify the, their targets, the location for the attack, and the types of weapons used. And then they will enter phase six, the preparation phase, where they, when they will actually acquire the means to conduct the attack. They will acquire a weapon or weapons. They will train to use the, the weapon, for example, Nidal Hassan went to a gun store in Killeen, Texas to purchase his um, Glock pistol. He didn't know how to use it, so he actually asked the salesman if he could show him how to use it. It's, so so th they will prepare, and th they might also do some internet research on, on their potential target. And then in phase seven, they will approach the target, which could be 
um, the, the previous day or, or the same day. And then in phase eight, which I, I don't think you can see, but um, they will carry out the attack. Now, all of these phase pre-incident phases also provide intervention points for preemption. So if you know someone who um, is, is expressing deep anger about something and saying that he needs to take some kind of revenge, then that's an, an early warning signal that should be dealt with either uh, by talking to the individual or um, suggesting the individual seek mental health counseling and so on. So you, you, you can, and also they, during phase three, they tend to leak their intentions to those around them or in, in social media posts. So th th these are very important intervention points. And then when they begin to cross the threshold, that's also an intervention point that those who know them can, can identify if they're properly trained. So that's why it's very important to, to train people, whether at schools or places of employment and so on, to, to be aware of all of these pre-incident warning signs that, that, that require some sort of intervention because the goal is to prevent them from carrying out their attack. And also the, the planning phase gives off a lot of warning signals that, 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 that can be reported and, and, and uh, it can be noticed and, and reported. And the same with the preparation phase. You know, why is so-and-so um, who's having all sorts of problems suddenly interested in acquiring lethal weapons and ammunition? Why someone who is, is not a hunter, you know, acquiring AR-15 um, assault rifles? And, and also these phases can lead to a de-escalation. So it's possible for someone in phase six to suddenly realize that what he's doing is completely silly and unnecessary and, uh, and stop at that point and then decide not to follow through with the attack. And it's also, uh, so if, if in, in, there are many cases where law enforcement is informed about suspicious activities by such individuals and they will, um, deploy informants to approach the individual and uh, talk to him and maybe pretend to assist him um, for a uh, preemptive arrest prior to carrying out the attack. So, so it's, it's valuable for, for law enforcement and others to use this type of a diagnostic tool to map where someone under suspicion may be along the project, trajectory into violence in order to stop them before an incident occurs, because then it will be too late. This is a, an, an amusing cartoon that I once found about this process. So some of my approach uh, is published in my pocket handbook on active shooter prevention, which ASIS International published in May 2016 in, in the second edition. And um, a more recent um, version of my approach was published in an article I published in the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's uh, 2020 Counterterrorism Yearbook, which is available online if, if you're interested. So please let me know if you have any questions. Dr. Sinai, thank you. 
And uh, I will take over at this point by pitching the questions to you for you to answer verbally, not every as uh, people listen to this, the recording, they won't have access to the text chat. So let me take this opportunity to um, uh, remind everyone that if you have a question or comment uh, in regards to what Dr. Sinai has just said, uh, feel free to type it into the text chat and we will answer all of those or comment on all of those. Um, and I'm going to start with this question from uh, George Lawless, um, a, a fellow Texan, I might add. Uh, would you, wouldn't yelling fire in a crowded venue be a domestic terrorist threat even without direct violence? Well, to, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, to qualify as terrorism, the perpetrator would have to be motivated by an extremist ideology or an extremist, a political ideology or religious ideology. So that's what qualifies someone as a terrorist actor. Active shooters are the ones who are more psychologically uh, disordered, um, driven. So, so you could, um, just to clarify there, a terrorist is very is relatively narrow defi narrowly defined yes, as someone yes. with an ideological um, reason for doing what they're doing. Yes. yes. Um, and but that doesn't mean that we're safe just because they're not a terrorist. That that uh, right. uh, they could be an active shooter with their own internal agenda that has nothing to do with their ideology. All right, uh, and Dr. Law. And also, I wanted to add that. Um, I've also done a lot of research on the use of hoaxes in attacks. And, and th this is a major threat because even a hoax can lead to severe disruption in the community and a huge expense for the local law enforcement. And there are many incidents in which terrorists use hoax devices in, 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 in their attempted attacks. And often for law enforcement, it's difficult to distinguish between a hoax device and a real device. So, uh, so actually, that's a very interesting point. And in the next version of my presentation, I'm going to add hoax weapons and devices to the types of weapons that, that are used by such perpetrators. Um, thank you. Elliot asks a very intriguing question. He says, how receptive are authorities to reports of early stages of attack? That is mental distress, threats made, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, there are cases of worst practice and best practice. So, um, the, the, for example, Elliot Roger, who carried out an active shooting attack in Santa Barbara, several years ago was his suspicious activities were reported to the authorities. And I think two police officers did interview him at his apartment, but they didn't check out his apartment where they could have found um, weapons and ammunition. Also, Omar Martin, who carried out the Pulse nightclub shooting was interviewed, I think by law enforcement but again, it wasn't thoroughly uh, followed up. But there, there are cases where the, the reports were um, re received by law enforcement and they did follow up uh, effectively and were, were able to um, prevent those attacks. In fact, that's an article that I keep meaning to write. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, and, and these, no one, they, actually, no one. I don't think any, anyone has written an article about best practices in preempting active shooters or terrorists that actually itemizes all the cases where they were successfully preempted. Only very rarely would the news media talk about something that did not happen. Yes, and uh, so we only hear about those horrible events that have. Uh, Jose asked this question, and I have a feeling that uh, your book that you just referred to would be a good resource. He says, any reference book for schools and malls, best security practices regarding active shooters? 
well, yes, I, I, I would definitely recommend my, my pocket handbook, and, which has, has become a bestseller for ASIS International. Let me go back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's called The Handbook on Prevention, uh, published by uh, ASIS in 2016, correct? Yes. Okay, and it's still... I, I, in fact, I've asked them uh, to up, update it in the third edition, and they are considering it. Okay, all right. And it's simply called Active Shooter. Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so that would be an easy resource to obtain. Um, I'm going to go back up, and it's, this uh, uh, George Lawless had a question. Ransomware is a financial crime, whereas DDoS, and I'm not sure what that means, might be motivated by intent to create terror as a level mm -hmm. of um, distrust in a trusted environment. Uh, George, I'm not 100% yes. sure I follow that question. I'm hoping Dr. Sinai does. Yes, yeah, I think it refers to a, a, den is it a denial of service attack. Oh, okay, all right, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, so, right, so we, we need to continuously um, anticipate new types of weapons and devices that would be used in attacks by active threat type actors. So uh, certainly um, cyber attacks should, 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 should be considered, but even though they may not involve the use of violence, they are so disruptive and costly. And if they are carried out by active threat type actors, you know, those who are um, lone actors who are ideologically or um, psychologically disorder driven, then we, we, we should certainly consider them. So far, it seems the ransomware and denial of service attacks have been carried out by organized groups, or criminal groups or state actors. But, but we should anticipate these types of attacks to be carried out by lone actors as well. Um, David Wells, I see you have raised your hand. Um, do you have a question that you would like to play, uh, place in the text chat? Maybe you have already. I've not got to the uh, end of the list, but if you do have one, feel free to do that. Um, let's come back up here. Uh, this is an intriguing question. On one of your slides, you briefly showed this, but did not really talk about it. Joseph asks, how would you best describe the events of January 6th? and also that uh, the Michigan capital. Right, so to be considered as an active threat actor, at least three out of the four types uh, need to be present. So um, there've been reports that allegedly some of the violent intruders got help on the inside, maybe from congressional staffers or others. So that could qualify some of them to be considered as sort of insiders. I mean, it's a gray area, but we, we, we need to anticipate new developments instead of always being surprised when, when they occur. So that's why I left it as, as, as a question mark, you know, could, and also, instead of just having lone actors involved, could a group um, type attack also qualify as an active threat attack? So th there are many gray areas. Uh, so, so, so we can't um, be overly rigid in the way we code these, these types of attacks. All right, thank you. Um, Jose asked this question. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I'll read it. Any public hoax management so that people and law enforcement get a central point of actual facts before proceeding? Again, I'm not quite sure I follow that question completely, um, but... Um, Right, so Maybe. one of the problems at, uh, with the, the, the call centers is that they often have to respond with incomplete information. So that's why it's very 
difficult for law enforcement to respond to incidents that involve hoaxes because they don't know if it's a hoax or a real attack as such. That's a very intriguing question or comment because um, they really don't know the nature. And of course, with any event like this, it's unfolding and it's changing. And so it would be difficult even to know if you were right there, what exactly was going on, much less being over the phone or being a dispatcher. Okay. Yes, and, and if, if an, an, an assailant is holding a BB gun that from a distance looks like a real gun, how should the SWAT team respond? Yes. Um, and, and this actually happened in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago. And my, my, my friend was actually involved in that uh, response. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a real dilemma for police departments. Um, Elliot asks a question. Do you have any comments or takes on what happened in Bethesda yesterday? Um, I myself being here in Texas, I'm not sure what happened in Bethesda yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, are you aware of uh, an incident that occurred? Uh, actually, no. Okay. Or Elliot, if you reported in the Washington Post this morning, which I read. All right. Elliot, if you uh, have time, you could perhaps type in a few comments here um, that might... Uh, give us some information on that. Um, I'm one, I see no more further questions, so I'm going to wait for a moment to see if there's any co other comments. Um, the, um, but this has been interesting. Uh, I shared this with Dr. Sinai a few months ago, but I'll share this again at a personal level. I used to work at Texas A&M University, and while I was there, uh, the entire campus was locked down. As many people know, they have an active ROTC unit on campus, and one of the students was carrying a rubber rifle. I mean, it looked like a rifle, but it was made out of rubber um, to drill, to simply walking across campus to get to where the uh, military drill was going to take place. Uh, someone saw him, a student carrying a rifle, panicked, called the police. The entire campus was shut down. It wasn't really a hoax. It was an innocent thing that happened. Uh, after that, the Corps commander said, nobody shall carry rubber rifles on campus. You'll have to have them in something, in, in some kind of case so that people can't see what it is. But um, how, my question, that's a, co a long comment for the question. My question is, um, how, especially in light of your discussion of hoaxes, um, we seem to have a hair trigger now that mm -hmm. people are very alert to to an incident like that. So even a, a bang from a, a backfire of a car would necessarily would set people off. Um, and um, what types of steps do you think those of us just who who go to church, who go to schools, who, sh who shop in the malls, who go to see a movie, all of them are, go to Walmart, as happened there in here in Texas, how do we protect ourselves or what are some steps that we ourselves can take to make sure that we are not victimized um, by this or we don't panic unnecessarily and live our lives in fear? Well, one technological solution is the installation of gunshot detection technologies hmm. that are being increasingly uh, deployed at schools and other facilities. It's a, it's a very difficult um, question to answer. Oh, and and there's, there's one point that I was going to make early on that, that I didn't, that, that I'd like to highlight here. Um, one of the advantages of looking at this threat um, more comprehensively as, as an as a active threat is that it helps to solve um, many definitional problems. For example, when Nidal Hassan carried out his shooting rampage at Fort Hood, Texas, the army considered it a workplace violence incident. And they were correct. It was a workplace violence incident. He targeted his fellow soldiers. They didn't consider it a terrorism incident as such because it's sometimes very difficult to prosecute someone 
under a terrorism statute? How do you prove that Nidal Hassan was a terrorist? I mean, he was, he communicated with Anwar al laki and, and he was radicalized, but still, can you prosecute him as a terrorist? So um, to me, it, now also the, the, the families of those who were targeted were concerned about it because if it was considered a terrorism incident, then they were eligible for all sorts of financial and other compensation from the military, which you receive if you are subjected to a terrorist attack. But as an academic, I, I was comfortable with the army designated, designating it as a workplace violence incident. And also as an academic, I, 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 I can afford to also describe it as a terrorism incident. So, so I think that there are advantages to, to using this umbrella concept to understand these types of incidents where several types of threat actors are um, present. So he, he was a terrorist, engaged in workplace violence, he was an insider, and he also engaged in active shooting tactics. So what so this also helps to overcome a problem in academia because there's a tendency uh, to specialize in one area of threat. So academics who write about terrorism only write about that. They don't look into um, workplace violence and where terrorists may engage in workplace violence or where terrorists may be insiders or may also be psychologically disordered and engage in active shooting type of attacks. So I think this helps to expand our uh, aperture and understanding of what is actually taking place at these incidents. So that's one of the advantages of looking at it from an active threat type of um, lens. I agree. The final comment here is uh, Elliot had expanded on what happened at Bethesda. He notes at the naval base, various bomb threats were made with a potential active shooter, uh, sh active shooter threat. Mm -hmm. So thank you, uh, Elliot, for expanding that. We are going to go move on toward the conclusion of the presentation. I think that answers all of the questions that were outstanding out there. I want to just wrap up the presentation by talking about a few things. One, we have upcoming webinars. The webinar on next month in November is with Dr. Brad Sims, maximizing your transfer credit and apprenticeship experience to complete a degree. A very different topic than this, but for uh, those people who uh, have worked through an apprenticeship and are going in to manage their own professional business, they can work at uh, work toward a degree with capital. And we'll talk about that. Then we'll take the month of December off and in January and February, we have two very interesting and related presentations. Uh, relationships to mitigate a cyber risk, the cyber risk in aviation with, doc, uh, with Steve Lusinski and Dr. David Gianna, uh, an expert on cybersecurity challenges in the financial sector. Uh, these are both areas, of course, that all of us are concerned about because we all trans uh, fly and we all bank. And so I would encourage you to join. Those last two are not yet uh, listed as uh, opportunities to register, but will be in the next few days. Now, speaking of which, to register or to learn more about our upcoming webinars or to watch any on demand, uh, this is the website that you'd like to go to. Now, we're just about done. A copy of the slides and a link to the recording will be sent to everyone who registered today. Just watch for an email. In the email, it'll invite you to uh, receive a certificate of completion with instructions on how to do that. That is an optional activity, obviously, but if you'd like to have one, all you have to do is respond to the email with the name you want on the certificate, and we'll be happy to send that to you. Now, with that, that does conclude today's webinar. Watch for that follow-up email. And uh, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free. Uh, I want to go back one more time and, and list, uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's, um, 
uh, go to Dr. Sinai's uh, email. I want to repeat it for you, J.B. Sinai, S-I-N-A-I, at captechu.edu. If you have further follow-up or questions or want to know more about the degrees that we offer at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level in counterterrorism, uh, he will be happy to uh, I'll have you reach out to him and talk more. But with that, we conclude our webinar today. I'd like to thank all of you who joined us. It's been great to have you on board and I look forward to seeing you again next time. With that, you can sign out. Bye now.